Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Raya Salter. And I'm Nicole Horry. In our show this time, we'll go to the State Capitol Auditorium for a public forum with some national experts on rail. The rail issue is in daily controversy and seems to be at a tipping point on both route and design. We need to follow what's going on. Of all the threads in local media, rail seems to be the most prominent. ThinkTech has been covering the issues in many of its talk shows. The forum addressed was known as Option 2A, Street Level Rail from Middle Street. The group that organized it is called Salvage the Rail. Salvage the Rail wants to modify the Heart Rail project to allow street level operation for the final five miles from Middle Street through downtown. Arguing that this will save money, $3 billion, save time, it would be completed in 2021 rather than 2025, and will provide a much more environmentally friendly system that can be easily extended to Waikiki and UH Manoa. The moderator of the program was architect Scott Wilson. He's been involved in the efforts of AIA Honolulu to research rail transit since 2009. He was chair of the AIA Transit Task Force from 2009 to 2012 and chair of the AIA Regional and Urban Design Committee from 2011 to 2016. He was president of AIA Honolulu in 2015. Rail has become um, a real contentious issue for a lot of reasons. And a lot of people are digging in on their positions, and I don't think that's the way to go forward. Uh, my name is Gil Rivier. I'm the senator for Senate District 23, which is the north and windward shores of this island, from Kaena Point around to Kaneohe. Um, the people in my district uh, feel very strongly about this issue. They're very concerned about the fiscal prudence of the rail system. I think most people love efficient transit systems, things that work, things that show up on time, things that are built and managed and maintained. So I think we can all agree that it's important to build our rail system appropriately. The question is, um, do we continue without ever modifying a plan that was designed many years ago? Or with the realities that we're facing today, do we consider an alternative. And I think what you're going to find today in this presentation, because I've met these three gentlemen that are going to be speak, and, and Scott Wilson, who will be the, uh, the moderator here, um, these guys have a compelling story to tell. They have the expertise. They've seen it work. They've seen systems that work. They know what works, what doesn't work, what's misguided. And they're going to bring you some information that I really hope you guys can listen with open minds and consider maybe this is what we should be talking about. And then maybe let's build this into a conversation. Today's forum is sponsored by Salvage the Rail. We have a website, uh, salvagetherail.org. Uh, if you're interested in following our, our um, in being on our email list, um, please go to that and sign up and you will get, you will get public uh, announcements as we, as we continue our work. Um, I wanted to just uh, explain our title, option 2A, but you see on the, on the screen there, uh, it comes from uh, June 2016, and in 2016, the FTA, the Federal Transit uh, Authority, notified Mayor Caldwell and Hart that, uh, according to calculations, their, their project was um, looking to cost approximately 7.7 .7 to $8 billion, and they, uh, the current funding had only been 6.8. So there was a shortfall. And uh, as a result, the FTA requested a recovery plan from Hart uh, and the city. So, uh, in the in the uh, process of, uh, in order to get the the remainder of the 750 million uh, federal funding, uh, Hart published this in uh, June of 2016. It was a it was meant to go to the public. It's on their website. It's just an update. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the contents of that update, if you go to the next slide, there were six options listed for how to uh, proceed with a recovery plan. And uh, I'm not going to review all of the options because some of them just uh, were really non-starters. I'm not even sure uh, what the point was. But if you look in the middle there, um, option 2A was build to Middle Street as planned and continue with at-grade rail system. So. Uh, that is uh, the option that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we we uh, don't know why uh, Hart really never pursued it. Um, we talked to them today, and they were actually very complimentary of our ideas. So uh, let's let's go on and um, 
And listen then, let's get started. After a welcome by Senator Gil Riviere and a history of option 2A by Scott Wilson, the first speaker, Vukan Vucic, gave us his remarks. Dr. Vucic is an emeritus professor of transportation systems engineering and city and regional planning at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He's lectured there and at more than a hundred other universities. Dr. Vucic's work has focused on urban transportation engineering, planning, and policy, and has been published in many books, papers, and reports. He has consulted with the U.S. Department of Transportation and the cities of Belgrade, Beijing, Lima, Moscow, Naples, New York, Perth, Philadelphia, Rome, Singapore, and others. The dominant mode used to be in World War II or so a streetcar or tramway. What happened with that? Well, it was systematically proclaimed that uh, streetcars are old-fashioned, that they're noisy, they're not flexible, and so on. Uh, that whole campaign was pushed by all, uh, several other major interests, uh, major lobbies of, of uh, uh, General Motors and Firestone and so on. And city after city, United States eliminated streetcars in nearly all cities except in Boston, Philadelphia, where we have tunnels for it and so on. Um, the, uh, no, no, not back. Um, the, uh, um, France and, and uh, Great Britain also mostly eliminated uh, streetcars. In Spain, Franco brought a rule, got away with streetcars, no discussion about it. Now, some of the countries were different. Germany, Netherlands, uh, Scandinavian countries and so on um, said, no, we do not want transit mixed with traffic and flexible and stuck in traffic. We want public transport to be separated so that it's independent of congestion. And therefore, they did not abandon uh, streetcars, they modernized them, upgraded them, and that went through years and several stages. So that, uh, that made so much difference that uh, we, at one time, we said, we cannot call this anymore streetcar. It must, it's a different mode, and we call it light rail transit, sometimes light metro and so on. Next, please. Uh, there was a, then thinking that, well, we now have so many cars, people drive and so on, we don't need rail transit or transit at all, except for some peak hours and some people who cannot, cannot drive and so on. Well, that was, uh, that was that proved to be completely wrong. With the increasing congestion, cities saw that they do not, they must not decrease and and neglect public transport. They must build better and more competitive public transport. That means that primarily rail transit benefits in large cities. In small cities, buses are okay. Medium cities. Still okay, but we, we uh, uh, try to improve transit. But in large cities, we see that we must use much more rail transit. So in 1955, there were 50, 20 cities in the world with metros, rail, uh, I would call it either rapid transit or metro is the same. So how many do we have today from 20 in 1955? Today we have more than 180 cities not only in North America and Europe and so on, but it's, it's in Africa, it's in, in uh, uh, China, is building about 15, 20 uh, metros and so on. What happened with light rail? Light rail came back, the countries that said we will not abandon it and invented light rail, they expanded it and they showed the others how light rail can be a very efficient system. So that, uh, uh, the uh, Germany and Central Europe in general maintained uh, uh, light rail, but what happened in France, which abandoned all, virtually all, 25 cities in France have now built new, recently built light rail transit systems. New systems in Spain, 25 new systems. Uh, now there's, there are some uh, light rail systems even in Africa, in Morocco, in Algiers, in Israel, in, in, in China, and all over the world. So that uh, the, um, the um, 
several hundred cities have built also light rail transit systems. The next speaker was Douglas Tilden. He has had a 45-year career designing rail transit stations throughout the U.S., in Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., and Miami, and in the Republic of Korea, Taiwan, and Greece. In 2007 and 2008, he was chief architect for one of the consultants to Hart. He now works as an independent transit consultant. I was asked as a designer of transit stations, I was asked to take a look at the design of the Honolulu stations, the Hart stations, and, and, and explain what would need to be done to those stations to accommodate light rail transit vehicles. Um, but before I do, let me, let me just say this, and the reason that I, could you pop the next one up, the reason that I'm showing this, um, all of these big, complicated projects go through various phases. And I think right now for Hart, I think that you're in what I call the frustration phase. As a community, you're very frustrated that things are taking this long. You're very frustrated that there doesn't seem to be a fixed budget or a fixed schedule. Um, we had similar problems when we did the Athens Metro project in that we had a client that was the EU in Brussels. We were going back and forth between Athens to Brussels. We had the parliament, the Greek parliament that we were responsible to. They had a different feeling about what they wanted. And then one of the big things that we, we, really, we really wrestled with on the Athens project was all of the antiquities that we had to deal with in our excavations. And what that meant was that as we, even though we knew that some of those antiquities were there, given ground penetrating radar, we had to stop construction. We had to bring the Ministry of Culture's people in to clear the site. We had to pay the construction contractors more money because of what we were finding. And a lot of those antiquities ended up in museums, some in uh, the actual stations. I was responsible for the design of those stations. And we have, uh, for instance, out in front of the parliament building in, in Athens is a, uh, we discovered a Roman bath we knew that it was, uh, it was pretty big, but we didn't know that it was 150 meters long until we started opening it up. So right there, we had to tell the, the contractor to stop the work on the stations. We had to get the people from the Ministry of Culture to come out, and it took them over a year to clear the site. The reason I'm bringing this up is that every one of these big projects has frustrations. But how do you surmount those frustrations? Number one, you establish a fixed budget that you work against. The budget doesn't keep changing. You establish a schedule that you meet, and if you get behind schedule, you come up with ways in which you get back on schedule. And you start at that point, because when we were welcomed in, in, in Athens by, by, by the Greeks, they told us, you're not going to get a darn thing built here. We've got a terrible history of not getting things built in our community. We set a budget. You can see that we ended up building it for $2.4 billion. We set a fixed schedule. We had good decision making. We had patience. We had perseverance. But we moved forward, and we built it, and we opened it eight years later on January 2000. And since then, in the last 15 years, the Greeks have extended both of those lines They've built a new line out to the airport, and the project is a terrific success. But I want to emphasize the fact that you've got to have clear direction. The community has to know how much it's costing. The community has to know what the schedule is. And you have to move forward with those two key elements in mind. Finally, we heard from Gary Andrushak. He has more than 35 years in city planning and design specializing in land use and transit planning, and has produced master plans concentrating on livability and pedestrian neighborhoods. His current projects include the Light Rail Corridor in Calgary, Alberta, and the High Speed Rail Project from San Diego to San Francisco. I'm going to speak about the um, transformative opportunities of rapid transit on urban environments, specifically on downtown Honolulu. 
I'd like to add that I work on a weekly basis around uh, North America on the des design of transit systems, and one of the opportunities of doing that is I see what people are doing, and I see what makes sense, and I see what, what troubles me. Um, so, so what I'd like to do is show you today what I think makes sense. I will add too that I live in Vancouver, Canada, a beautiful, livable transit city. So with that, let's go to the first slide. Now this one's a bit cruel perhaps, but um, it's a, it may well be a candidate for Ripley's Believe It or Not. Um, I had a hard time believing it. Uh, next. And this is the end of your line, and I'm not sure they need the no parking anytime sign at the moment because I really didn't see a lot of uh, pressure on, uh, on the curb next to it. I, I will show you uh, the next slide, which is the end of the line, and I call this one number two because this is the, the end of the, the, you can go to the next slide. This is the end of the line of, a, of, a, of an elevated system in, in suburban Richmond, British Columbia, which, and you can see, um, I think I can do this without taking these fellows' eyes out. Um, the end of the line, for starters, they realized that the end only had to be a, a, a single guideway rather than a double guideway because the double guideway is one station back. So they have the lights on in that, uh, on that case. But you can see immediately after um, building this thing, the developers came in and realized the potential of it and, and, and uh, put the density where it should be. Next. Now, Vukan spoke about the, the, the really the linear transit corridor, and next slide, and Doug's talked about the stations. What I want to talk about, next slide, is really the context of the community that this system will go in and through, because as, as I said when I started speaking, I see um, what we're dealing with here is an opportunity to, to really refurbish um, downtown um, Honolulu in and, 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 and a very positive manner. Next. Um, I had the benefit when I went to grad school in Copenhagen of, of, um, of getting to know a professor, a fellow named Jan Gell, who may, some of you may know. He, to my mind, he's the preeminent urbanist in the world today, and, and he's, he, he's written many books. His latest one is Cities for People, and of course the, the premise of of that one is that city should be for people and not for cars. Um, in 1971, he, he wrote a seminal book called uh, Life Between Buildings, and the thesis of that one was quite simple. It's that a city is not buildings alone, it's the spaces between that matter most. And, and, and really in 1971, what, what he was commenting on was what, what we would call the emerging profession of urban design. When I started uh, going and uh, taking architecture in the 1960s, we had architecture and we had city planning and we had landscape architecture, but there wasn't a profession that really looked at how all of those pieces came together and how done properly create to the synergy that we need to, 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 to make um, uh, to maintain the cities that we have and make them function uh, better and make them more, more beautiful. Next. So, when, 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 as an urban designer, when we look at transit, we look at a, a, a variety of, of, of things. We look at what, what I would call a series of over, overlays, one being the transit overlay, one being the open space overlay, and one being the buildings overlay. After they spoke, Scott Foster summarized the points at issue and called for questions from the audience. Here's some of the Q&A that followed. This seems like a great urban planner's design <clears throat> that looks great, but wouldn't it be really much better to just stop the damn thing at, Alo uh, at Aloha Stadium and just leave it there and leave buses to take things? I mean, it might be nice to have all of these fancy LRTs going on King Street and looping at Alapai and come back, coming back, but you know that costs money. And let's take out the politics and the federal and the feds and all of that. But wouldn't we be much better off, quite frankly, to just stop it at Aloha Stadium? And the second related question is, regardless of what it is, how do we get from where we're at now? to where you guys are proposing taking us. I mean, not talking about the dollar amounts, but what are the logistics? How do we get the ledge, or the city council, or Hart, or the feds to sign on to 
your proposal as it stands now or as it might be modified. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Who would first, I think there was one question there about the sort of the one C ride question. You know, should we stop the system at Aloha Stadium? Uh, Bukhan, would you like to address that? Well, that would mean that uh, that would mean that you would have a rail system where there is light traffic, very little traffic, and when you come to the main area where where, where you have a lot of traffic. You would, you would give it to the buses, and buses are already overloaded and they are reaching its capa their capacity. So it, it would not be justified that we yeah. build that long line in suburbs and use that speed where there's no, there's no congestion, there are no people, and here to be with, with buses, right? Yeah. Also, could I, I I'll ask Gary about, um, who rides buses and who rides trains? Yeah, I, w I was going to pick up on that. One of the things that, that we notice, time, yeah. Can I add, do you want an answer? Okay. Um, we have a very hard time across North American cities converting car drivers to bus riders. They're far more interested in going from the car to the train that somehow it seems classier, or a better ride or whatever. But, but another thing that, that happens, and I see it over and over again, is that, that we, as, we, we as planners, we tend to think that everybody is the same. And of course, what I'm seeing is, th is this tsunami of change from younger people, from the Gen X and, and, and the Gen Z, who firstly don't want driver's licenses, don't want to own cars, want to live in downtown cores, and want to be tr reliant on, on transit and on walking and on riding bikes. And if you do what you're suggesting, you're not going to, to play into that, that generational promise that you need to rejuvenate your city. All in all, this was an impressive program on an important community issue with a world-class panel of transit experts. Many people showed up to hear what was said, but the city wasn't there, and although some legislators appeared, in large part, neither was the state. After all the controversy, could it be that no one cares? We should all care and stay informed. Want to know more about Option 2A? Check out salvagetherail.org. The rail project will define our city, our economy, our way of life, and our community for many years to come. And now, let's take a look at ThinkTech coverage going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar, and we don't hear much about them. But ThinkTech will take you there. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 to stay current on what's happening in government, industry, and academia around the islands and the world. ThinkTech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show, or if you want to share our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com slash radio, and we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech, green screen First Amendment studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or appear in our shows, write to talk at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. 
We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. You can call in to our talk shows live. While you're watching, you can call in to 808-374-2014, that's our new number, and pose a question or make a comment. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Nicole, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Nicole does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the issues relating to transportation in these islands. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Raya Salter. And I'm Nicole Horry. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>